Over to you, Joy. Would you like to? Yeah. We've got a few people here. Okay, good afternoon, good evening, good morning from where you're joining us. And we are really happy to have you here today to this side event on drylands and climate resilient development. We are looking at valuing climate variability. Thank you for joining this interesting session. We shall be looking at some um, etiquettes as we wait for others to join. So feel free to type into the uh, chat where you're joining us from, your organization, and anything interesting that you, you, re you, you recall about drylands. Uh, this is a, an interesting session and we're really happy to have you. We are here with IIED, CELEP, DADO, um, Reconcile, ALDEF, Kenyatta University, and also all of us are stakeholders within the Brescia research, where we are looking at how to build capacity uh, for sustainable food and water security in drylands. So we are the dryland session. Welcome. On the screen, you can see the um, structure of this session. I think as we go through it, uh, think about drylands. Are drylands variable? Are they fragile? Are they diverse? Think about all these things that you hear about drylands. And um, we will start actually with a session uh, with an interactive poll that looks at what do you think about these drylands that we so often uh, imagine to be fragile and try to see, can we use integrated approaches? The Zoom poll will have five statements about drylands and you'll either vote whether you strongly ad agree or disagree and feel free to chat um, in, the, in the chat box as well. We shall be having uh, three main presentations, um, uh, mainly looking at a different way that we can look at drylands, look at some examples, and also look at some policy implications um, of some of the uh, variability that we see within the drylands. I think now um, I'm, I'm glad to see many of you are continuing to indicate uh, who you are and where you are from. I see some familiar name, feel very welcome. Feel free to continue um, uh, typing in the chat. And um, I think we'll go directly to the, to the poll. Feel free also to put other comments as we move along. So we are moving directly into the uh, poll. And this will be question one, says the natural environment in drylands, especially low and very much rainfall is a major constraint for food production. Kindly you can strongly agree, agree, neither agree or disagree, disagree or strongly disagree. And um, any additional comments in the chat? I can see uh, disagree is uh, moving at 75%. Um, now at 83%, while 17 have agreed, and at 86%, the disagreement uh, back to 75%, that the natural environment, oh, there are some who neither agree or disagree. Please, you could write something about why you neither agree or disagree, or strongly disagree. So strongly disagree and disagree is actually 71%. And so um, there's disagreement that actually the low and variable rainfall is a major constraint for food production. Okay, um, anybody who would like to um, add further on why they disagree or agree, please feel free to just type in the chat. Thank you very much. So we are moving to the second question. Um, Please, if you could all participate, we noticed that only a percentage participated in that question. Uh, livestock mobility is a coping strategy, and this is mainly in response to pasture and water. And so far, 100% have agreed, and that is just, uh, okay, so more people are responding. Thank you very much. So this is still a volatile one. There are mixed reactions related to livestock mobility. 
with 38% strongly disagreeing as the highest percentage. Um, 36 plus 29 plus 27. So 56% are agreeing either strongly or just agreeing that life support mobility. So far, six, uh, 17 people have participated. Kindly, if you've not, um, you can do that. So still we can see the results here are mostly towards agreeing. Again, um, we, we have about six people who are yet to participate. Please give your view. And also you may want to type something in the chat about your, your thinking towards why livestock mobility is a coping strategy or otherwise. Okay, so... Um, so strongly agree at um, and agree at 61%. We can move to question three. Uh, dry land environments are fragile ecosystems. Uh, thank you, Philemon. You'd say pastoralism equals mobility. And that is why you're agreeing that it's a coping strategy. Thank you for that. So dry land environments are fragile ecosystems. Again, this is one where we have um, different opinion, mo mostly half half agreeing and half disagreeing. And um, still moving on, I, I still see the agree and disagree almost at 50-50. Uh, agree and strongly disagree, disagree and strongly disagree at um, at forty seven percent and agree at um, at forty five. Thank you, uh, Prof. Sanya, Chris. I see you say that food production in drylands is very complex and it can be looked at from various perspectives of interest. Later on, if we have time, we may invite you to tell us these complex perspectives. Okay, so. Um, Strongly agree and disagree is 45% and uh, disagree and strongly disagree is 50%. So almost at par. That's a sentence that we, something that we need to discuss further. And 6% uh, neither agree or disagree. We would need to, you know, discuss that further. I see um, further comments of people introducing themselves. Welcome, Dado, Salah. Some of these um, acronyms later, it will be good to just unpack them. So thank you. That's, this is a, a question where we are 50-50. Are they fragile or not? Okay. And uh, finally, the last poll question. And um, this is large-scale agricultural production in the drylands is a better way to ensure food security than small scale subsistence farming. So which way drylands? Uh, which way drylands? And um, already uh, it's a disagreement, uh, strongly and, and disagree that definitely we should not do dry large scale pro agricultural production. Some voices have come with some agreement and uh, we see 14% that are agreeing compared to, okay, 12% agreeing and 88 disagreeing. Uh, any, anybody else who needs to add in? Okay, thank you. I see you're still also continuing to introduce yourself. Welcome very much to this session. Um, any, anybody else participating? Because we have 69 of the participants. I don't know that you're having challenges with um, clicking. So definitely this one goes towards disagreement. Okay. So I think uh, we can say that there are so many perceptions towards drylands and uh, whether drylands are westlands or whether they can be used and how would they be used sustainably. And so this side event, as I had said earlier, is looking mainly at what alternative perspective to drylands. And we 
are looking at what we call valuing variability, valuing climate variability. And we want to then showcase some strategies and production systems that are definitely um, supporting this kind of valuing variability and then consider some policy implications of this perspective of valuing variability. So those of you who have experience, you may continue to share also in the, um, in the chat as we begin. I'm now um, going to um, bring to your attention our first presentation. And um, our first presentation by Zaverio, who will introduce himself shortly, um, is actually introducing to us this concept of value variability. Welcome, Zaverio. Thank you, Joy. Um, I am I'm working on, on pastoring. Been, I've been working on pastoring for, um, for the last 20 years. Um, I'm editor of Madi Peoples, as you've seen in the chat. Um, and I just move into the presentation because we don't have very much time. And if there is more time later, I will add information about myself. Um, the last uh, 200 years of fossil fuel based economies have eaten up the planet and eliminated its biodiversity at an unprecedented pace. The impact um, on the natural cycles has has made climate variability and the related uncertainty a global issue. Failing to stop global warming is expected to lead to a global catastrophe scenario. Therefore, resilience to climate change, when we talk about resilience to climate change, uh, we only refer to the, to the several decades of uh, unprecedented global climate variability once global warming has been stopped. In the context of agricultural development, the response to high levels of variability in the natural environment has always been an effort to increase control. Investing in reducing variability and trying to introduce stability. This modernist approach or, or project um, of emancipating agriculture from the vagaries of, of nature continues to enchant policymakers and donors alike. Efforts in this direction have uh, relied on transfer of technology and mechanization schemes, dams and large scale irrigation, motorized water extraction, chemical fertilizer and pesticides. Even the current race for fighting climate change through green energy industrialization, as eloquently argued by Jeff, Jeff Gibbs in his 2020 documentary, The Planet of the Humans, remains within this man against nature perspective. Dependent as we are on externalizing costs and risks, we struggle to grapple with the idea of something that simply cannot be externalized. Is there another way? As the natural world is becoming more and more unpredictable under our eyes, scientists are calling for a fundamental rethinking of conventional globalized agriculture and food systems, no matter their merits, and a move away from dependence on energy intensive and resource intensive processes for externalizing nature's variability. The value and variability concept belongs to this perspective. It is rooted in lessons from regions of the world where climate variability is neither a novelty nor an anomaly. And it focuses on the experience and knowledge in small scale food production systems with a long track record of operating in these conditions therefore demonstrating its significant and empirically tested levels of resilience. In the drylands, the availability of potential inputs expands and contracts dramatically through the year and um, at unpredictable intervals between years. Patchy and itinerant rains of varying intensity make it impossible to predict from one year to the next if a crop will mature or grass will grow in a given location. Environmental variability is further increased as rainfall combines with other variables. 
for example, the way biodiversity or soil or the morphology of the terrain can affect absorption and evapotranspiration. Environmental variability rules in the drylands, high both in time and in space, from the macro scale of uh, interannual, seasonal and regional variations, all the way down to the, to the micro, micro scale, um, um, or plants and leaves uh, or, or crops. For example, nutrient content changes within the life cycle of a plant and between day and night, but also between plants or between different parts of a plant. Users like pastoralists and dryland farmers learn to manage their relationship with the environment over time and space and across scales in order to turn such a restless change into valuable resources. They do so by finding ways of changing at the same pace with the environment and by keeping their options open to match the uncertain future. Adaptive drylands food systems specialize in achieving lower variability in outputs by matching the variability in the environment with variability integrated, deliberately integrated in the processes of production. Variability in processes is preferred to stability and uniformity. A variable range of locations is preferred to just one location. Keeping a variety of species in the herd or a variety of crops in the field is preferred to keeping just one. Where variability is the norm, working with variability rather than against it means higher productivity and more resilience. Some groups of pastoralists in the Sahel move south at the beginning of the rainy season to meet the rains. Then as the season progresses, they follow the rains all the way back north to the edge of the Sahara where pasture is best. This strategy aims to keep the herds on green pasture for longer than it would be possible in any of the locations visited along the way. When successful, it stretches the rainy season in the experience of the animals. Similarly, some farming communities in the high, uh, in the dry highlands of northern Ethiopia leave stones in their fields, reducing the surface of the soil and therefore the concentration of moisture uh, in case of rain, increasing it. This effectively increases the average rainfall in the experience of the crop. Same amount of rain covering a smaller surface, higher concentration. In both examples, the producer strategy consists in introducing variability. It is worth emphasizing that the natural environment that matters uh, in relation to people's livelihoods is not the detached ecosystem of geography and natural sciences. People's experience of the environment is almost unfailingly mediated by other people, either directly or in the form of social and institutional interfaces. In value and variability, natural resource management is not the management of stocks of objects, but the management of the relationships that enable certain people to experience certain things as resources. Fertile land is a resource in relation to agriculture. Oil and coal are resources in relation to fossil fuel economies. A drought is not the same experience for those who can move somewhere else and for those who cannot. A flood is not the same experience if your livelihood depends on recessional agriculture or, or, or not. In practice, it is usually impossible to isolate climate stressors from the background of non-climate stressors. Mm. Valuable opportunities can be small, scattered, and short-lived. And in Zaverio, you need to unmute yourself. You have muted yourself. Oh, when? Oh, I think maybe the it was muted uh, in trying to mute the other uh, noise in the background. Sorry. Aha! Uh -huh. I I don't think I did it. Um, when okay, did okay. I? When did you stop hearing me? <laughs> just uh, like or just now. Two okay. Seconds. Yeah. Um, an intimate knowledge of the landscape by people and animals down to the morphology of the terrain and its biodiversity at the micro level can make a big difference, but not without the appropriate social and institutional infrastructure. So let me recall the key elements of value and variability. The first one is that where the variability 
in the natural environment is experienced as an obstacle or as an opportunity for food production depends on the production system. Drylands food systems aim to lower variability in outputs by matching the variability in the natural environment with variability in the processes of production. And finally, opportunities and risk can only be defined from the perspective of the users in the here and now. They cannot be um, imagined or, or, or deduced um, a priori. There are also two important implications to these, uh, to these three tenets. And the first one is that thriving on variability is possible, and indeed uh, many professions specializing in doing it. We think of air traffic control, finance, international trade, or the pharmaceutical industry. And the second is that interventions that reduce the variability in the processes of production lead to higher variability in outputs, although apparently are aimed at reducing variability. African food, uh, uh, African food and agricultural systems are considered hotspots of vulnerability to climate change, and especially so in the drylands. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, resilience to climate change rests on the capacity to shield production from the vagaries of nature by means of high energy inputs and intensive use of resources. The problem with this is that high energy inputs and intensive use of resources to separate production from nature are very much what is raising global average temperature. They are part of the man's against nature approach that has precipitated climate change and that continues to fuel global warming. Mitigate the effects of climate change by continuing to depend on these measures might work locally for some on the short term, but at the cost of keeping the planet on the present trajectory towards catastrophic runaway climate change. Dryland systems might not appear so resilient at the moment, but their resilience is resting on working with nature rather than against it. Scientists believe that in the Holocene, changes in the global average temperature have remained within plus or less one degree centigrade. The, la the latest report by the International Panel for Climate Change of just a few weeks ago says you that have, the global you warming- minutes. You have three minutes remaining. I'm about to finish. Says that the global warming has reached uh, one plus one um, centigrade, degree centigrade already, and predicts that it will reach one plus five by 2040 in the most optimistic scenario. Plus one plus five, 1.5 degrees uh, centigrade, well, that is the threshold of the Paris Agreement, is already 50% higher than the record of the last 10,000 years. Beyond this threshold, the risk of triggering a tipping point in natural systems is predicted to increase sharply. So facing this pro prospect, there might be more future in the relative, relative vulnerability of working with nature and valuing its variability than in the current resilience based on fighting it. And that's my conclusion. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, th the last slide much. shows the pastoralist turn variability into food white paper that has just been produced by Celeb and uh, and of course the Breccia and Kenyatta, Kenyatta University course on value and variability that is in preparation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for keeping time and um, I, I am thinking of what Philemon said, um, pastoralism equals mobility. So how variable are the drylands? We want to look at a short video as you digest what Zaveri has talked about. This is a very short video of pastoralism is the future. And um, as the video plays, uh, take time to comment in the chat so that we can come back to some of the issues. And um, this is um, a, a three minute video that will just show us what, what is going on, and um, it is by Sella. Thank you very much.
On about 40% of land on Earth, rainfall is highly unpredictable. Where and when crops and pasture will be able to grow can change from one year to the next. Food production systems that depend on predictability struggle to control these natural environments, even with costly investments. This option was never truly sustainable, and with global climate change is meeting its limits. But depending on predictability is a choice. It does not need to be that way. Highly variable natural environments actually offer opportunities for food production when producers specialize in being in the right place at the right time. Pastoralists are such producers. They specialize in making sustainable use of highly variable environments to produce food. By managing their animals' grazing itineraries to match the changing opportunities in their landscape, they can keep their herds in a relatively stable condition. They track beneficial combinations of forage plants and highest concentrations of nutrients. This keeps their animals on the best possible diet that only a variable landscape can offer. When they have the freedom to move to the right place at the right time, pastoralists make sustainable use of the natural environment and produce organically for domestic markets and export. Conventional food production systems that choose to depend on predictability need to combat variability to control the natural environment. With climate change, the natural environment is becoming even more variable everywhere. This is now our common future. If we learn from pastoralists, environmental variability can become an asset. They are walking the path to sustainable food production systems in the face of climate change. By sustainably turning environmental variability into food, pastoralists are already in the future. Thank you very much. I was expecting to see some comments in the chat um, regarding um, the presentation on value variability. I thank you all. Maybe you are digesting and we'll continue to bring some of these comments later as we move on. I'd like now to introduce our second presenter, Dr. Fiona Ngarachu, who I'll allow to introduce herself and she'll showcase some local strategies and production systems that would, would ideally be part of um, integrated into a climate resilient system for value variability. Welcome, Fiona. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, thank you, Ali, for sharing the slide. So as was mentioned, I will be focusing on illustrating uh, value variability through various examples. Uh, next slide. So the focus, this is an overview of my presentation. So I will start with uh, various examples with pastoralists and it has been mentioned by the chat, focusing on mobility as a strategy, but looking at the various diverse ways different countries have applied this across different contexts. Then we'll also have some examples around crop farming, which does happen in the drylands, and the focus will be quite a bit on moisture conservation. Then I'll talk a little bit about how, through this Breccia project, building a capacity for sustainable food and water security in the drylands of Africa is integrating value variability, and just a quick conclusion and some useful links. Next slide. So we'll be focusing on about five very quick case studies. Uh, first in Wajir in uh, northeastern Kenya in Kitui in southeastern Kenya, in North Kordofan in Sudan, as well as examples in uh, Malawi, Ghana, and Uganda. And in Uganda, we'll focus on the Karamoja um, area. Uh, next slide. And next slide, that's just a map of Karamoja. So first and foremost is in um, Wajir. And um, the first example that I am displaying here is mobility linked to um, water harvesting slash water conservation. And what you can see here in your picture is a water pan, which are very common across the dryland areas, especially in the north of Kenya. 
And this is a, just a small reservoir that's uh, created by excavating the open ground, as shallow as one meter, as deep as about three meters. Um, that's really used to collect the water, collect and store the surface runoff during the rainy seasons, which can be quite um, significant, uh, especially with flash flooding, um, et cetera. And this is mainly used by the pastoralists to stretch the rainy season and in combination with mobility, so moving from different water plants to different water plants. It works with the variability in rainfall and the dynamics between the dry season and the wet season to provide um, water for their livestock. And you can see there in the picture right in the distance, there's some goats that are um, getting some water and as well as um, some households there accessing this particular water. Next slide. Um, the next example, uh, moving from Wajir into uh, Uganda, country in East Africa, another country, is on um, different aspects of mobility. So you can see a picture there of a pastoralist, you know, coming into new lush landscape with um, his cattle. And that there's different ways that mobility can be used by pastoralists to adapt to variability. So one of the first ways is um, mobility. We think a lot of times, I think, of mobility as occurring during the dry season. That's kind of the traditional way we think of mobility, that during the dry season, pastoralists will move from water point to water point or grazing land to grazing land um, for their cattle. But this is a bit of a counter argument, that mobility can be used with the kind of variable distribution in different pastures and water in time and space. Um, during the rainy season as a proactive strategy. So not a coping mechanism, but a proactive strategy. So this is where they move from pasture to pasture during um, the rainy season to get their cattle fed and get them fattened um, and be able to sell them at the market at the highest price possible. We can also think of mobility in terms of market access. And here we have two examples, one in Niger and one in Uganda. So for the Niger example, we have a pastoralist who have really perfected a system that allows them to sell their livestock, move their livestock to different markets and to certain markets at certain times of the year when the prices are the highest and to be able to sell their cattle at those particular markets. Now, once this is done, they're not only selling their cattle, they also need to buy you know, grain, food stuff, et cetera. They don't necessarily buy them at those same markets. So through technological innovation, such as mobile money transfers, they're able to transfer this income earned from the sale of their cattle to other discount markets to buy grain, which is maybe cheaper than the original market where they were selling from, and therefore they can maximize um, you know, the variability and this variability not only in I mean, precipitation, but also in trade to their particular advantage. And for the Uganda example, um, you know, mobility is applied in the Karamoja region uh, to enhance the market access. Uh, so mobility in the rainy season supports basically, you know, the fattening of the cattle so that they're providing a more valuable commodity and marketing um, this animal in the various markets. And this is also supported by um, both technological, te technological innovations in the mobile systems and also scouting to track, similar to the Niger, Niger case study, different locations where the market prices might be best. This is also used to track, for example, where grasses may be salty or where the, the grazing lands are more secure. And these are all forms of how our pastoral mobility can be used in very diverse ways. Next slide. So from uh, Uganda, we move to uh, South Kordofan in South Sudan. And this is a case study of the portable water um, bladders. So previous assumptions state that, um, you know, or, or more traditional ways of thinking of water in the drylands, state that, you know, water has to be found locally, it has to be fixed, it has to be permanent, it has to be a borehole. All those are useful, yes. But in this particular innovation, part of the problem in this area was that um, the settlements around the water points or that kind of access at the water points with large herds and large number of people wanting that particular access was leading to land uh, degradation. So the solution that, um, or the innovation that was proposed was that we can use, you can see that picture, that is a water, a portable water bladder. It's just that, it's, it's this um, unit that can fill up with quite a lot of liters of water and be transported on something as simple as a camel to a truck to the areas where the pastoralists are. So in this way, we are um, 
you know, not, not, not basically confining the pastoralists to particular water points and kind of leading to land degradation. But we are matching a variable process, which are the bladders, that's the variable process, to the variable input in terms of rainfall slash access to water. And this is what Severio was talking about in his introduction to the concept. Uh, next slide. So that's just what I've discussed um, before. And that's just the quote that I wanted to read out from the um, article Standing Wealth 2013, that portable water points such as the water bladders match access to water with selective and transient use of pasture made possible by strategic mobility. Next slide. So now we are done with the pastoral examples and we're looking forward to a lot more discussion of these and other examples during the breakout discussion group. So keep the chat going and keep these in mind. Uh, we're moving now to Kitui in Kenya, a semi-arid area where, uh, where a lot of agriculture takes place rather than um, pastoralism and small scale livestock keeping. So on your left, there is a picture of uh, road water harvesting which is one of the innovations that has been used uh, to cope with the variable rainfall in Titui. Um, I was there in uh, 2019 and um, during some interviews, what, what I found interesting was when asking the farmers whether rainfall has increased or decreased in the last 10 years, quite a significant number of them talked about it increasing but over a shorter period of time. So leading to flash floods and a lot of waste of water. So this was one of the innovations um, in terms of digging culverts around the road systems because the road systems are very good with channeling water from the higher areas, especially when there's high rainfall uh, to the lower lying areas where the farms are. And using these channels and culverts within the farms through water ponds, zipe pits and channels to conserve that water for farm use and sometimes, yes, domestic uh, use. And the picture on the right is uh, sand dams and river wells, also in Kitui. And this is an innovation that's used in seasonal rivers in the area. These are rivers that flow for about six, three to six months during the year. And um, what is used is the natural sand that's located within the river. You can see here at the back, the high river bank. And what this is used is during the wet season to channel water into these, you see here the lady fetching from the lower area. This is a natural dam or river well. And using very basic tools and not that much money, simply labor, they can be able to dig out these wells within the seasonal rivers. And as I said before, with the Wajir example, stretch the rainy season a little bit longer and use that water again for agriculture and in this particular case for domestic uh, use. Next slide. So next example takes us a bit south to Malawi. And this is um, among agroforestry um, innovations that I know a lot of us have probably more experience and more detail in, and we'll look forward to getting that in the breakout groups. So this is traditional agroforestry using a specific indigenous tree located in Malawi that uh, grows its leaves in the dry season quite nicely, and that provides you know, fodder for livestock. But in the wet season, you can see here, it's planted within a maize field. Um, the leaves actually drop in the wet season, not the dry season, and provide mulch and um, cover for conserving the moisture within the soil. And again, stretching that water and stretching that rainy season for a better crop within the drylands. Next slide. Um, the next example is also on soil moisture conservation, but this we're going to West Africa and focusing on Ghana. This is a picture my colleague took of a farm in Ghana, and you can't really see, but if you squint a little bit, you can see that there's stones that have been placed. This is a field, an actual field where seeds have been planted. It looks kind of bare and desolate, but that's not actually what it is. So those stones do have a purpose, and this is called stone bunding. And this is the Talesi region, uh, Upper East region in Ghana. And what this does is farmers strategically place stones in their fields. And these are not boulders or rocks necessarily, but small stones that are available within the landscape. And this is really going much more into the micro level than the macro level of soil and water conservation. And what these stones do is direct moisture um, to from rainfall, for example, to the plants underneath and also provide cover for the moisture conservation and allow the plants to be able to, again, stretch the rain and be able to use that moisture throughout the rainy season. 
Uh, next slide. So those are the examples that uh, we had for you today. And I know there are many, many more that we can further discuss. Um, and so one of the ways that we are now um, integrating this concept of value variability within this specific Breccia project, as I very, very quickly mentioned, is developing curriculums at various levels at Kenyatta University. And one of the first ways we're doing this is by reviewing the current course offerings that teach or talk about the drylands. For example, at KU, we have an ASAL course, ASAL meaning arid and semi-arid lands, at the undergraduate level and also similar courses at postgraduate level. So at this undergraduate level, we are re-looking at what we teach about the drylands through the lens of value variability to be able to start, so to speak, right from the beginning with these students who are going to go out there and be, you know, the future officers, policymakers, et cetera. And currently right now, we are also developing a short course specifically targeted at current policymakers to um, both look at what the current thinking is about around drylands and also try to integrate and internalize this concept of value variability um, within their work and how they can actually integrate it in policy and practice. And as I conclude, I re repeat again that um, this is really more about, um, if, sorry, thank you, next slide. This is more about introducing variability in the processes to match the variability in the outputs. And by doing that, we can unlock opportunities again, as was talked about in the video and in Severus presentation, that are inherent already to the existing environmental variability that has been there. It's not a recent phenomenon. This is how communities have been traditionally dealing with it. And going on to my next point, that it really needs to start from the local people and opportunities need to be seen at the micro scale as well, and not only kind of focusing on the bigger picture macro scale. And I know in the next presentation, uh, my colleague Ahmed will be kind of trying to see how we can, you know, use this variability or embed it within policy. So the last slide is just a list of links uh, to uh, literature and as well as the Standing Wealth um, article that I referenced. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Fiona. And um, I wish to draw attention also to um, the link to the CELEP paper uh, in the chat and also the documentary on green energy, which has been also indicated in the chat. Philemon, thank you. I have seen your question on what are the macro disincentives this, this, this to investing in variability-based systems. We'll come back to that later. And there are many more uh, links that have just been given by Fiona Garachu. I had told her to introduce herself and uh, she did not. Uh, Dr. Fiona Garachu is a research fellow in the Department of Geography, Kenyatta University, working on the Brescia project. So um, we want to invite you to another short video as you um, digest and look at the, ex um, think about the examples. As Fiona said, many of us in this um, meeting right now have so many other examples that we can share on um, uh, things that are currently going on, being integrated in moving towards a climate re resilient dry land. So feel free to also share links and other resources in the chat. So we'll have another short video on the International Year of the Rangelands as we think about just the examples that we've looked at. Welcome.
Thank you very much. I now would like to invite you to our third presentation. Um, Dr. Gilbert, I've also taken note of your question and um, on how will the effects of changing land tenure systems be absorbed by pastoralism that we shall discuss later. But now I'd like to invite Ahmed Ibrahim, who is the CEO of ALDEF, to make his presentation. I will also invite him to say um, something further about himself, but he'll be looking at lessons from implementing the devolved climate finance mechanism in the drylands of Kenya, Tanzania, Senegal, and Mali. Welcome, Ahmed. Thank you very much. I said uh, well by Joey. Uh, I'm Ahmed, been working in the Thailand's uh, region and the Horn of Africa for the last uh, 30 or so years, uh, across uh, different, as a consultant, as an employee of the government, as a civil servant, working with INGOs and also now localized with the national NGOs, uh, as well as uh, the convener of the ASAL network uh, recently since 2019 that's trying to do a dry, uh, demand driven approach to dealing with the policy and uh, practice in things related to ASAL. So uh, I'll take you through uh, my presentation uh, for today and the lessons are said on climate finance mechanisms uh, in Kenya, Tanzania, Senegal, and Mali. These uh, programs have really been embedded in legislation, institutionalized such that then uh, it works forward to the next level of how devolved climate finance can trickle down from global level county national level and as well as now sub-national level we are further looking at it with the structures going down at ground uh, world level in kenya i'll try and explain what that means as we go through the slides the devolved climate finance mechanism uh, basically in these five counties is what i'll touch on which is uh, given in the diagram on the right as how it flows. However, uh, in Kenya, the DCF mechanism was done under the STAC plus, uh, plus, uh, STAC plus and uh, STAC uh, funded by DFIT, as well as uh, CEDA and the World Bank under the Adaptation uh, Consortium, which is housed under the National Drought Management Authority. It contains, uh, the consortium contains a number of uh, local partners working at the county levels, which are five uh, counties in Kenya, uh, as well as Kenya Meteor Meteorological Department, Christian Aid, WIED, and previously included resource uh, advocacy project program as well as UK Met office. This program ran from 2011. In Tanzania, the DCF uh, consortium is chaired by the president's office for regional and local government and was implemented in three uh, districts. Funding ran from 2014 to 2018 was under the Tanzania Climate Change Institutional Strengthening Program, funded and uh, that was followed by an aim for resilience. Uh, the consortium partnered with the UN uh, Capital Development Fund, local climate ad adaptive living program uh, to form the local CFI uh, mechanism, which is the climate finance initiative. In Mali and Senegal, the, the DCF uh, project was implemented in the regions of uh, Mopti in Mali and Kafrin in 
Senegal. The funding ran from 2015 to 2019 from UK aid under the BRACED program, Building Resilience and Adapt Adaptation to Climate Extremes and Disaster. And also BRACED X that followed in. The consortium was led by Near East Foundation with the Innovative Environment and Development and Africa and uh, WID. As you can see now in the diagram on the right, uh, the climate change funds and the circles that are in blue uh, give how the flow of funds happen, which later we'll uh, discuss a little bit along, around the CAF, uh, which is the climate uh, fine fund, which is called the DCF. And how decisions are really made within uh, these structures, which in the end go to uh, public uh, investment goods. These are prioritized together with uh, local communities who are elected from a grassroots uh, approach and proposals uh, flow to the local government and administrative uh, and technical sectors based on the needs and priorities that come from the communities. So in essence, the CAF has in Kenya a bit different now, but uh, initially started off with a 90% of the funding going to do the investments and 10% to cover the administrative costs. But in Kenya, through looking at the PFM Act, the Public Finance Management Act, then it only allows 3% for administrative. So 97% goes into investments. Next. So these devolved climate finance mechanisms are five key principles, which I had said from a community-led planning model, where there are experiences and knowledge and institutions of climate, uh, managing climate uh, variability and extremes is maximized on. We have an un this anchored in a way that it's supportive and within a devolved system. For example, in Kenya, uh, we are talking about devolution in the 2010 constitution uh, that created 47 uh, subnational level governments, which are called now the devolved units. And that is how it is anchored in. So the approach allows most of the knowledge and experiences that are the decisions where the government institutions working alongside the institutions that are customary and builds and adds on to the existing structures. This uh, DCF also has a social inclusion of climate variable uh, people and creates structures that are um, that address the power, power balance and dynamics of decision making between the stakeholders at the different levels of uh, the planning uh, system. Looking at the DCF where you have the ward planning committees, then you have the county planning structures, then each of those different levels have different stakeholders in it. Uh, the mechanism also is very flexible and adaptive um, uh, management is used because it is responsive to the local realities and changing conditions. So the priorities that come and whatever the knowledge is coming from the communities informs uh, the needs and how the investments are really uh, prioritized. It emphasizes on public goods investment. Uh, these public goods investments that build on the current production system also adaptive systems that uh, adaption systems which the people are using, which account for better community dependency on their common resources, reinforce, reinforces need and to anchor the community priorities in the existing and high level government planning. So the components are on the right. So we have the climate change fund, then we have the climate change planning committees. We have the climate information services and participatory planning tools. And then we have an m &E of resilience building. These are the four key components, which we'll discuss in the next slide. 
and these four mechanisms are anchored within the mechanism uh, the, the CCF mechanism such that uh, this CCF mechanism has to work within a certain set of uh, operational features in order now to enhance climate resi resiliency in the dry lands. So local governments support what community have identified so that then we can be able to get the sustainable benefits to the people. And then we have some kind of a transformative uh, adaptation. So the key operational features include that the resources that we are talking about, 70% goes to the lowest level where here in Kenya, for example, we are calling it the world level. So this fund responds to the community priorities and the specificities of the local context within the highly ASAL uh, variable uh, ecosystem. So in this instance, what normally happens, which we'll check in how the processes of identifying these uh, priority needs really come into being, then 70% of that resources, which we are talking about 97, goes into it. Secondly, it strengthens the community control and choices of the implementation of the investment. Where in the ASAL uh, context now, the communities identify a certain kind of public good or a social services, which now is within the boundaries of where they are and where it, the kind of uh, priorities fall across uh, the same for different wards then an inter-ward process normally happens. It encourages more effective and participatory and inclusive kind of uh, planning process where communities prioritize, do a uh, normal- uh, Ahmed, uh, Ahmed, you have two minutes, Ahmed, you have two minutes. Yes, yes, thank you. So these priorities are normally um, prioritized and then the communities are able to say if it's water, if it is uh, any kind of other response, then the technical department's input. Can we get to the next, uh, please? The next slide. So in this context where there's a lot of other uh, major problems in the arid lands, which you know, marginalization and droughts, floods, a number of things, that is within those kinds of contexts, then we need to really deal with this. And how we do it is through an empowered kind of approach, which is capacity building, CIS processes, agenda representation of the of these different level committees, a public goods investment, and then the resilience uh, planning tools include uh, seasonal calendars, a resource map, and this really helps to really uh, create that balance that we are looking for. Next. Next slide, please. So you can see as an example, uh, this is uh, PAN, which was talked about by the presenter before me. What really happens in that kind of uh, PAN, it is in that kind of state. And after the communities have prioritized the investment, resources have been released through a service provider model, because they cannot directly be given to the community themselves. The service provider is monitored, and then it ends in uh, the one on the right end is after you conserved that water, then you're able to get those kinds of uh, water kiosks, which the women are able to get clean water. The second one in between uh, is more about using uh, as well the solar uh, systems on the boreholes and really uh, helps to be able to deal with climate uh, variability. But in my conclusion to this uh, presentation, there are key things that, are that we need to capture. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, right now, as we speak, this process started off from a five uh, county and it's in almost 29 counties, which have established the systems out of the first seven counties in Kenya with around, uh, I confirmed again, around seven uh, operational and functional now. However, a phased approach will incorporate the learning and address the new challenges experienced in the different counties. 
an example where this has influenced government in Wajir County, where in the election of 2017, the government that was chosen was chosen on a platform that they will be able to come up with world development projects, and they are able to give 750 million of the budget to be able to do that kind of projects. And this resulted in close to 300, uh, so far, 300 small community projects to climate change. There's also need to value empowering vulnerable communities and their institutions in order to really deal with climate change challenges. And institutionalization is the key continuity, the key to continuity and sustainability of interventions uh, beyond uh, the different five year cycle of government, because governments are selected, are elected every five years. So far, uh, we have a draft World Development Fund bill that has been developed, which now tries to link to the bigger uh, processes in 10 ASAL counties, and the assemblies are going to be deliberating soon. This will also be linked toward uh, development plans alongside uh, disaster management cycle kind of priorities in hotspot areas, and then anchored within the planning and budgeting processes, which now communities can be able to use these development plans as tools to monitor implementation of their priorities in a yearly basis by government. So thank you very much for that short uh, presentation. Yeah, thank you very much. There's really a lot that we can discuss from that presentation, but I think uh, an important take home message is the community-led planning. Um, you know, understanding that uh, the communities themselves have experienced, they've lived there all their lives, they have the institutions, the knowledge, and actually recognizing that information. Uh, thank you so much, Ahmed. And um, kindly participants continue to write comments. I've seen a comment there, which we may think about later, whether the drylands are dry gold. And uh, this is something we can think about as we now move into the breakout rooms. I know I've been giving you a video after each presenter, but this is even not much more exciting because you, we get to go into small groups and flesh out further what we have been uh, discussing here. So um, there, there will be three groups and uh, kindly, uh, once you get into the groups, you'll get further instructions. Thank you very much. Continue to write your comments and anything into the chat. Thank you those who've been contributing. Thank you, the presenters as well. Welcome back to the plenary. Um, somehow the, the minutes go very quickly. And before you realize you're just being bumped back into the main room. So we <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, my group had very exciting um, uh, discussions and um, one part participant was uh, describing some interesting aspects of Ethiopia and suddenly we were brought back here. We're happy to be here and um, I want to invite us to make presentations of like three minutes from each of the groups and um, I'll start in the order of group one, group two and three. Just three minutes, just some highlights. Um, I know each team was able to get um, a note taker. Uh, this is a, a, a position which was hotly contested in our group. Everybody wanted it and uh, we ended up giving someone. So I know you have somebody who is ready to present. So group one, kindly, let's hear some um, reporting back from what you discussed. Yes, I can do it. Um... We, we had the, the um, opposite situation. Obviously, all those ready to volunteer for reporting must have been in your group. And uh, okay, um, shall I share the screen or uh, let me share the screen? Yes, you may uh, share the screen. You see it? I see the screen. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, I mean, do you see the the jumbo the jumbo um, screen? Yes. 
everything is up so very yes okay good okay um okay so to the first uh, to the first question um there was a bit of hesitation um but um eventually um we we uh, decided um that um, um overall um there hasn't really been um enough experience of applications of value and variability to uh, at least within within our group to to make um, strong strong examples uh, there was a general um, appreciation of the uh, of the concept um, um, someone made a comment about the um, the uh, possibility of using it with relation to animal health uh, taking advantage of a, of a biodiversity um, and eventually uh, someone uh, thought that policymaker didn't really value the approach enough um, with regard to the second to the second question uh, again uh, we thought that there was a need for a stronger recognition of a, a pastoralist contribution to food systems. Um, there was some discussion of a vision 2020, 2030 in Kenya, and especially the, um, the comment uh, uh, about the fact that um, uh, although there is a strong emphasis, emphasis on variability in the, in the, in the document, um, it seems to have been particularly complicated or difficult to then uh, translate that attention into practice um, and, and putting community at the center um, hasn't been sufficiently oper operationalized uh, and someone emphasized the fact that value and variability is like pa pastoralism is transboundary in nature mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. finally on the third question um, there should there should be um, more support uh, to the to the um, uh, to, to the concept in 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 in, in that it has a, a capacity to emphasize uh, um, community adaptation, especially to climate change, as an immediate result. Um, and the obstacles identified are. That there are contradictions in policies, land use change, and, and land grab. It was an example of the the way uh, pastoralists lost access to a significant amount of rangeland in the Low Omo Valley in Ethiopia um, that has now been converted to plantations. So general general anxiety about uh, uh, the, the the way um, the, the trend that is is still going on. Uh, uh, with regard to small scale producers and pastors in particular to lose access to resources and, uh, and, and a question on, on whether value and variability um, is, is a, has a future or not. Um, at the same time, one could ask whether the alternative approach has a future or not. But that seems to be a question that is more rarely asked, although um, it should really be on everybody's mind in light of climate change. And that's my conclusion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, any members from the group, you may add additional comments in the chat so that we move on to group two, because we are having 10 minutes to end of session yeah. and we would like to listen to everybody. So group two. Yes, um, I think I'll report back for group two. This is Fiona. And um, first things first in our group, we talked about how the VV concept wouldn't necessarily be something that's easy to understand or for policymakers to integrate. And, you know, understanding of variability really will inform a lot of the kind of development interventions that will happen. Um, and also that uh, from the policymakers perspective, um, you know, it, it might be difficult uh, for them to see variability as an opportunity. For example, we see a lot of, um, you know, programs where it's planting trees, yes, which is good, but cutting down of the indigenous trees. So a lot of inappropriate policies stem from this lack of understanding of the importance of valuing variability in 
the drylands. And another case study was about you know, index-based insurance programs, which have a tendency to focus on sedentarization. So that's one of the issues that we can address um, quite quickly. Um, so in the next slide, um, in terms of integrating this into policy and practice, um, we also discussed that VV really applies in all world contexts, not only say in developing contexts. And um, how we see this being adopted is more from kind of a bottom-up approach and a community planning approach. If that is fully integrated, the public participation perspective, um, that is how you can, one of the ways we can achieve VV in, in practice. Um, and one of the key issues we discuss here is how do you move beyond value variability just being something that's adopted in projects or something that's internalized more widely and that is basically normalized. So the same way we normalize this issue of you know, drylands being scarce, drylands not being productive, how do we change that narrative and internalize it? So it doesn't depend on funding or projects coming in to be able to uh, you know, achieve what we want to achieve. And the other key thing was capacity building is what is going to be important here in terms of adopting this perspective across the mm -hmm. um, board. And just finally, this is when time was running out. Some of the barriers, of course, are first resistance from you know, the key policymakers or the gatekeepers who we really need to possibly uh, target with, with this fairly new or new concept or new way of thinking. And also one question we raised is how, you know, a lot of the donors and governments are really interested in more capital intensive projects, kind of showy, huge, larger scale projects rather than people and knowledge intensive projects. So that's something we need to think about also as we move forward. And finally, there are a lot of issues to consider, especially around land and land policy when we're talking about value variability in the drylands. And so issues around land tenure and this idea that you know, land can be used for multiple purposes. So if you're having a solar field in the north of Kenya, that doesn't mean cattle cannot graze around that area. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, group two. And now we move to group three. Again, um, any group member with additional comments or clarification, just kindly just put it in the chat because um, we have just five minutes remaining, group three. Okay, thank you very much, Joy. Um, Ken, you can share your screen. Um, yes, thank you very much. So um, on the first question on experiences, I think uh, the general consensus was uh, that vari the variability can be harnessed for gains either in drylands or beyond on food security, resilience, and economic well-being in general. Uh, there was sh sharing of experience, for example, in the United Kingdom where uh, it used to be like all this uh, working with nature before then after world war, the second world war uh, it became highly mechanized uh with clearing of large fields reduction of hedgerows just to provide uh, spaces for industrial agriculture but then now there's a movement to actually go back to sustainable system of food production agroecology organic, organic food production and just working with nature uh, to do that as well um those concerns around the impact of government large projects investments um, that are beyond the pastoral's capacity to just value variability. Uh, for example, sugar plantations in some of these areas then uh, make it very, very difficult for pastoralists to just practice their pastoral way and uh, mobility uh, as, 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 a, as a way of, as a livelihood way. Uh, we also discussed issues of just the, how we've normalized bad ways of living with nature, of, of not valuing uh, the variability, anthropocentric ways of lifestyles, the speciesism, believing that human beings are, can continue to live while exploiting everything else. Um, so variability is viewed as, a, as, as, as something to be controlled as opposed to as something to be, to be exploited. Um, I know the first question, lastly, we talked about the, the education as a tool, uh, whether in Kenya, for example, using the CBC, um, to reorient educators and reorient uh, the young generation on, on, on just value vari variability. Uh, on question two, to what extent uh, we, see, we see value variability as a perspective adopted in policy and practice in our countries. Um, I think maybe a, a good place to start was about an assessment that has been done on, uh, the, for example, in Kenya on the CIDPs, uh, looking at the extent to which food and water security in the assault is presented in the CID, CIDPs and the assumptions underlying some of the CIDPs is that actually they perceive variability as a problem 
and pro so proposed solutions are large scale irrigation, reducing livestock mobility, as opposed to looking at how they can take advantage of, 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 of variability. And then there was a, a plenty of conversations around some of the policy solutions that can be, pro um, can, be can, can be helpful. Capacity building of, 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 of county governments, for example, working with county assemblies, uh, especially with governors and the political goodwill there to just normalize the valuation of variability in some of these uh, counties, working with communities themselves so that they are on, drive, on, on the driving seat and uh, the driving seat, involvement of young people in, in schools through clubs, for example. Um, let me see. I think also that I think for me it's uh, from a donor perspective, how can we also work with donors to just reorient where they invest as well, uh, probably away from some of this large scale industrial agriculture that undermines the valuation of variability to, to channel some of these resources to more uh, agroecology and regenerative ways of, of, of food production. On question three, uh, what would be the implications of adopting uh, value variability perspective uh, in policy and practice? Um, I think some of these things have been alluded to already. We talked about participatory planning as a critical thing we need to look at. Um, there was the whole challenge of modernization of ecosystems for purposes of production uh, with the assumption of, of that we will have greater productivity if we, can, if we can rein in variability itself. So I think the implication is actually we have to have a paradigm shift and be other than what we are currently uh, in terms of production. Some challenges and barriers. Um, the first one is enabling environment for participatory real work, for example. Uh, there's huge uh, role to be played by political will and policy frameworks as well as to create those enabling environment. Uh, the challenge of political short-termism. So for example, in Kenya, we've just changed the cabinet now. So sometimes you build dependency on an individual or a politician and then once they change office or the governors go and new ones come in, you have to start from scratch out, uh, as well. So that's a, a, a key barrier. Um, and there was a proposal to how can we make it systemic so that it's not dependent on individuals, but it's dependent on the system itself. And lastly, uh, the challenge of, we we're talking about Ethiopia actually, where dry lands cover huge geography, geographies, some of them with different economic systems. And the challenge there is sometimes uh, what is happening in a, in, a, in a different place is completely different from another one. Uh, in Ethiopia, I think the, our colleague was sharing about how they build relationship with politicians. Uh, to make it mobility of, of mobility as a system itself, of, uh, as a system of livelihood for pastoralists, uh, normalizing within captured within the policy framework, and probably some of these lessons we can learn from our, some of these countries. Um, yeah. I'll stop there, and then my, my group will add in. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you so much, Group Three. Actually, it's it's already eight p.m. Oh, eight p.m. on the Kenyan end, and I noticed a number of people dropped off, perhaps because of that timing. I just want to uh, maybe point out some key issues. One being that uh, value variability can be ha harnessed. That has come out clearly. And that we need some community-led planning. We need to also recognize that um, value variability is transboundary. And indeed, when we were talking with the Ethiopian colleague, also the Ugandan, all this, um, areas that we call drylands is one continuous system. And so even as we think beyond um, how to harness it, we need to remember it uh, transboundary. I saw a point from one of the groups about disease outbreaks. So any disease would obviously uh, affect all that, um, uh, all that ecosystem. And then of course, education as a tool. And um, I think coming from Kenyatta University, I would say, are uh, we able to come up with curricula, even at university level, short courses, and uh, see how we start influencing uh, by retraining or re-enabling them to think differently. I don't know whether, um, uh, given that it is time up, whether they will, there was a the question from Philemon. I think that was the only question um, that, that looked very complicated. In fact, I had said I would have allowed Philemon to speak. Um, and then, of course, the issue of the dry gold and the issue of land tenure we've discussed. So if we have five minutes before we end, it would be good to just um, hear the thinking behind that question. Because remember, Philemon, you came up up with the issue of um, when you talked about pastoralism equals 
mobility. And I think that question that you raised was uh, linked to that. But the question, as you can see, is, is, quite, uh, is quite deep. Perhaps I'll allow you to unmute and say something about it. You may even have the answer. Well, uh, Prof, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, those are some of the, I mean, I got an opportunity to ask a question that has been pondering our minds. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I mean, as we, I, I actually introduced myself in the other, like, uh, uh, like group. Uh, I work oh, at the International okay. Life Research Institute. And, okay, um, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so uh, we have been uh, working on promoting an uh, index-based livestock insurance program uh, in, uh, in both Kenya and, uh, and, and Ethiopia. And, uh, we have had uh, several interactions with several uh, groups, uh, stakeholders working in the past things. And um, when you promote a product, for example, a novel idea like uh, insurance, uh, it, you, you, you feel some pushbacks uh, from some quarters. People fail to take it up, though you think that people at the end of the day, they are rational in a sense that you would want to embrace a product that actually cushions you from some shocks. So it then like takes us back to like the, 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 the generic question, of, well, what are the incentives that are necessary for people to adopt innovations, right? Mm -hmm. so, if you, if when, we, when we fail to get answers to that, we ask ourselves, so well, what are the disincentives in that sense? Mm. Like what, what discourages people from taking up mm. these innovative mm. ideas, you know? So then, uh, well, we get several answers from and uh, outside our teams, but still we are not yet convinced that we are at a point where we can uh, disentangle the I mean, understand clearly what would be the entry point mm -hmm. for an innovation so mm -hmm. that it can be embraced, especially mm -hmm. if it has got very clear direct effects and direct benefits to the livelihoods of the people concerned. So that is the background behind uh, the question. And uh, I thought this could be a good opportunity to maybe share to another platform and maybe a group of experts, maybe I will be able to get uh, some sort of uh, feedback. So that is it, uh, Prof. Thanks. Yeah, th thank you, because I see in future, we may also invite you to give um, a talk on that and uh, the perspectives of where you're working from. So uh, good people, I know it's time up, but thank you so much. I would have liked us to listen to Abdul Kadir from Ethiopia, but those who are in the group who are already um, got some points from there. So I would like uh, to bring this to a close and to thank the team that has worked um, and to thank you for staying um, to the end. Uh, we should be able to provide you um, the materials that we've used during today. And if you have any further comments, it will be good if you can send them. We'll be sending you an evaluation, I think, and uh, just so that we can improve in future. Thank you so very much and um, enjoy your evening, morning, afternoon. I think for the people where I am at, they are rushing to the dining table. Yeah, thank you so much and, and goodbye.